guys, welcome to my YouTube channel where we're always talking about ways to enforce purpose in your life. Now, if this is your first time here, I would love you to click subscribe. Make sure you like this video, leave me a comment. I love to hear back from you guys. Hit that notification bell so that you can be alerted anytime a new episode comes out. Now, we are starting a new series and in this series, we're gonna be talking about mastering your wilderness seasons. So hang with me as we start today talking about is God really good in the midst of a wilderness? Now let's start talking about what is a wilderness season. We all go through those times in our life where we feel like, oh, I just can't seem to uh, get any traction. I'm not really sure what direction I should go in. I can't really see a very clear path. I don't see any fruit in my life. I don't feel like I'm producing anything. I just feel kind of blah. I feel like I'm in a holding pattern. Um, I can't feel any sustenance. I don't see any um, evidence of my work. All of these would define a wilderness season. Sometimes we call it a winter season where we're walking through a season where nothing seems to be producing life. Or maybe you're legitimately walking through a season of death. You're in a season of grief. All of these things would be considered a wilderness season. So I want us to really take a look at these wilderness seasons press into them and ask, what is God doing in the midst of these? And how do we begin to redefine wilderness seasons so that we don't dread them? Because if we're honest, nobody wants to welcome a wilderness season. But God has designed all of creation to flow through seasons. And we learn from that, that God has designed us to also flow through seasons. Now, I'm not just talking about this, the actual and natural, natural seasons, but I'm talking about spiritual, emotional, mental, circumstantial seasons as well. So a wilderness season is a time when there seems to be nothing happening. There's no activity. I don't feel productive. I don't feel like I'm getting any traction. I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. I'm not sure where I'm going. It's a time when I don't see any fruit in my life. I feel like I'm working, but I don't see any evidence. Um, it's a dryness where you feel parched or starved of something. Now this could be, again, circumstantially. It can be mentally or emotionally. Now I just had a friend ask me because I was sharing with her five or six months ago that I felt like I was in a really wilderness season and I defined that in the, in the ways that I felt like God had promised some breakthroughs, but I wasn't really seeing those breakthroughs and I just felt like a lack of productivity in my life. And so just today she asked, do you feel like you're still in a wilderness season? And I had to pause for a moment because in the last six months since I first shared that with her, I've had a lot of mental and emotional and spiritual breakthroughs. And so mentally and emotionally and spiritually, I do not feel like I'm in a wilderness season anymore, but nothing has changed in my circumstance. And that's what we're gonna be talking about throughout this entire series. We're gonna be talking about how do I change my perspective? How do I have spiritual fruit in the midst of circumstantial dryness? How do I have mental, emotional productivity? How do I feel found like I'm okay and I'm content? I feel a sense of, of peace and it is well with my soul, even when I am legitimately walking through a season of wilderness where I don't see any movement in my life. I know I'm talking to somebody who's watching this where you hit that frustrating season in your life where you're like, oh, I keep running, I keep moving, but I can't seem to get any traction. I just don't see any movement in my life. Well, one of the things we need to recognize is what the world would call a season of death or what the world would call a season of lack of productivity. There is no fruit, which if, there, if something is not growing, in science, if a, if a tree is not growing, if it's not producing fruit, the roots are already dead. And so that's evidence that the tree, the roots of the tree are already dead. It, the world has taught us that when we don't see fruit, um, that the deadness of our circumstance is bad or it's negative. But Jesus redefined that, God redefines that by talking about all the things that he does through life and how he actually uses death, I'm sorry, about all the things he does through death, how he actually uses death to reproduce life, how he actually uses death to produce more life. Now, in John 12, 24, it says, Jesus says, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much more fruit. So God here is redefining our understanding of a season where we don't see any life. We don't see any productivity, a season of death, winter, wilderness. I don't see a clear path. I feel lost. God is saying that those seasons are actually necessary to produce more fruit in our life, in our relationships, in our business in our ministries, whatever it is we're doing. Now, we know that in the natural, every winter, when we look out into our yard, when we look out the window, all the trees, all the bushes, all the flowers, they all appear to be dead. But we know that in creation, that in the deadness of those branches, there's still life. In fact, We expect from year to year that after the deadness of the winter season, it will bring forth a spring of not just fruit, but more fruit than the year before. We expect our trees from year to year to grow bigger and bigger, even though they go through a wilderness. Moreover, we also know that that wilderness, that winter season is essential to the production of more fruit from year to year. We know this. When I cut my knockout bushes all the way down and they, when they die in the fall and in the winter, I cut them down every year. I expect that they are going to be bigger that spring than they were the year before. So we learn from this that God is teaching us even through creation that every winter season is essential to the production of more fruit in our life. Now remember, we're looking at how do we redefine the wildernesses of our lives? How do we stop dreading them and begin to recognize the biblical truth and the biblical necessity of wilderness seasons in our life? So Jesus is using the law of creation in John 12, 24 to show the power of death and the necessity of death to produce not just life, but more life. Remember, it says John 12, 24, 25, he who loses his life, he, he, who, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So even our salvation was birthed through a death. Through the death of Jesus Christ, he produced life for other people. And when we choose to die to our flesh, we come alive in the spirit. So it's important for us to understand that when we're walking through a wilderness season, when there is seemingly no life, or there really legitimately is no life in what we're doing, we're not seeing any productivity, we're not seeing any fruit, we can begin to recognize that there's a biblical principle that God must be working something out in me. And in the end, I will not just produce fruit, but I will produce more fruit than I did before. This is John 15. John chapter 15 says that he is the vine, we are the branches. And in that he says that even those who are bearing fruit, the branches that are bearing fruit, He prunes so that they will bear much more fruit. This doesn't make sense to us, but it's how we grow a vineyard. It's how um, farmers' vineyards, it's how they produce more and more fruit. And God does the same thing in our lives. So we should expect life. We should expect more life, more fruit, more productivity to be the outcome of seasons of wilderness. In Isaiah 41, 18 through 20, he's, it says, I will open rivers in desolate heights. Desolation, it's talking about dry places, dry spaces in our life, desolate heights, heights, places that aren't producing fruit. He's saying, I will open rivers in those places and fountains in the midst of valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water. Now, this is a declaration that you can declare. If you are in a wilderness right now, I'm going to highly encourage you to say, God, you say in the middle of my wilderness, 
there is a pool of water that you are making that you're going to shift this wilderness season into a pool of water that you are going to shift this valley into a fountain that you are going to shift this desolation into an open river for me that's what it's saying in here and the dry land springs of water that this dryness in my life is going to be shifted it's going to produce springs of water now this requires a paradigm shift for us because when you're walking through a wilderness season and you're challenged to live and have your mind set upon what you see and what you're actually experiencing instead of what God says is true. When God says you can be in the middle of a wilderness, but you're actually experiencing an open river in the spirit. You can be in the walking through a valley, but you're actually experiencing fountains of life within you. And so we've got to learn to retrain our mind to shift from what we see in the natural to what we know God is saying in the spirit and biblical principles about a wilderness. This passage goes on and says, I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set it in the desert, the cypress tree, the pine and the box tree together. He's saying in the middle of a wilderness, I'm going to bring forth all kinds of life. I'm going to bring forth trees and greenery and good things. Now, this doesn't make sense in the natural. We don't see these things in a natural desert. But God is saying when you're walking through a season of wilderness, when you're walking through a seasonal or circumstantial desert, if you keep your eye, if you keep your affection set upon me, that's what it says in Colossians 3, 32, keeping our affection set upon God. If we keep our minds set upon things above, then we will begin to see that I, I am actually walking through a seasonal wilderness, but in the spirit, but emotionally, but in this relationship, but in my attitude, but in my character, I'm seeing fruit. And that's what he's talking about here. I want us to train. This is why we're talking about redefining the wilderness from is God really good to declaring even in a wilderness, God is good. I need you to remember with me all the way back in creation, that was the first trick of the devil was to get Eve and Adam and Eve to say, gosh, if, if God was really good, why would he be withholding this from us? They're in the middle of all this fruit and, and the devil comes to him and says, did God really say? And so when you're walking through wilderness, of course the enemy is going to bring the same message. And he's going to say, is God really good? If God was really good, why wouldn't he bring productivity into all your work? If God was really good, why wouldn't he produce fruit from all of your efforts? If God was really good, why isn't he bringing a breakthrough in the midst of this wilderness? If God was really good, why isn't he showing you a path in the midst of what you, you say you feel lost? And he's going to ask you that question all the time. He's going to try and trick you and get you to doubt the character of God because if, you are re if God was really good, you wouldn't be in the wilderness season. But the truth tells us that God is good and he does goodness even in the midst of a wilderness season. See, changing our mindset, understanding, coming into an alignment with God isn't saying, God, pull me out of the wilderness. It's saying, God, I recognize that you're in the wilderness. And if you're in the wilderness with me, I can handle it. Let me go on in this Isaiah passage, Isaiah 41. That they may see, so I said, I will set, the de I set in the desert the cypress tree, the pine tree, the box tree together, that they may see, which means give attention to or have vision of that they may have sight and they may know, which means they may become acquainted with, they may perceive, that they may see and they may know and they may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. Now, let's be honest, when we're in a wilderness, who do we usually start blaming? We start blaming the enemy or we start blaming our circumstances or we start blaming the people around us. But according to this passage, it's saying that there are, and one of our episodes is gonna be about God-driven wildernesses. This passage is saying that God often, that, that God is the one who's in there and he allows these seasons that we may come to a place where we have vision of and we become acquainted with the hand of God and the way that he works. That's what, that's what this passage is saying. In the message, it says everyone will see and it will be unavoidable. It will be indisputable that God's hand is in this. 
God is always at work with our life and the inclination in a wilderness is to focus on what he isn't doing. The inclination is to focus on what we're getting, what we're not getting. The inclination is to focus on all the negative things we want to validate and continue to confirm the wilderness instead of learning to shift our eyes on things above and recognize that in the midst of this wilderness, there is a lot that God is doing. How do we know this? Because God is always at work in our lives. God is always at work on your behalf. He is always working for your good and for his glory. Remember Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And that word purpose there means a deliberate plan. You are called according to his deliberate plan. So we don't want to give the enemy credit for what God is actually navigating in your lives. We don't want to give the enemy, we don't want to acknowledge the enemy when it's actually God who's in the midst of this. Remember, Jesus was driven into the wilderness. He was driven into the wilderness, right, by the spirit, not by the enemy. And the enemy was at work in that place. And we're going to talk about that story. The enemy was at work in that wilderness, but the wilderness was not authored by the enemy. The wilderness was authored by God himself. It was authored by the Spirit of the Lord. It was a necessary space and a necessary uh, place for Jesus to hang out in so that he could become more fruitful, more, uh, more abundant in the manifestational works of the Spirit. Before this event, Jesus did not flow under the power of the Spirit. He had the Spirit of the Lord within him, but it was right after the baptism when the Spirit came upon him, he was driven into the wilderness. And in that space and in that place, God, in fact, the Bible says he went, went into the wilderness filled with the Spirit, but he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. Okay, come on, I need somebody to get this. A lot of you have gone into your wilderness and you were filled with the Spirit. And God is saying, if you let me work here, I will great bring you into a greater understanding of the power of the Spirit. And you will come out of this place, not just filled, but you will come out of this place empowered in the Spirit. That's the abundance. That's the flowing river. That's the acacia tree. That's the fountain. That's the spring. That's the, the more, the much more fruit that God wants to do in your life in the midst of a, of a wilderness. We never hear God say, oops, I didn't know. Oops, I didn't know it was going to happen. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, I made a mistake. There are no mistakes in where you're at. God is with you and he is very intentional. So when I meet with clients, especially those who are in seasons of depression or grief, the tendency is for them to focus on all the things that are wrong in their lives. And I know that's our tendency is to, to really, especially when you're in a counseling room, right? You're there because you want to talk about all the things that are wrong in your life. And there's a space and a place for that where we have to acknowledge these are the hardships in our lives. And, <clears throat> but if I'm not intentional to say, okay, now we need to begin to shift and start training our eye to watch for what is God doing in the midst of all of this. If I'm not intentional to shift there, we could end up spending our entire hour just talking about all the negative things that are happening in their life, all the ways the enemy is working, all the, the things that they don't have, that they're not getting, that isn't happening in their lives. And they end up walking out feeling worse because all they've talked about the entire time, the entire hour, is all the negative and all the desert and all the wilderness and all the winter and all the dryness and all the drought. And again, there is a time for that. But if at some point we don't shift and begin to look for what is God doing in the midst of this and start training this client to start thinking about how God is moving in the midst of this, then where is their hope? They end up spending the entire hour just talking about the problems and we never get to the answer, which is in Jesus Christ. So it's easy for us to focus on the negative, but the Bible commands us to set our minds on the positive. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Okay, so what is he saying? Are you in the middle of a wilderness? You got to find something praiseworthy. You need to start talking about it, meditating on it, thinking about it, 
uh, just ruminating on it in your mind over and over again. Find that thing. I don't care if it's, I, I tell my uh, teenagers like, look, look, I don't care if it's that you had gummy bears for lunch. I want you to find something that you can meditate on that was good, that you enjoyed in the moment. God is giving us an, an antidote to so many things in Philippians 4.8. And just learning how to, and, and a lot of us have heard this verse, but we don't do it. We don't actually activate it in our lives because we don't do what it says. We just are a hearer of the word and not a doer of a word, thus deceiving ourselves. That's what it tells us in James. But he's saying in this, look, even in a wilderness, if you teach and train by, act, act, by practicing and activating through action, th what this passage is saying, which is setting your mind on these things. Meditate on these things. On what things? The things that are true, the things that are noble, the things that are just, the things that are pure, the things that are lovely, the things that are of good report, the things that are of, that are of good, ver uh, are praiseworthy. That word meditate means to take count, to calculate, to take inventory. And a lot of us need to practice that in our lives. We need to take inventory of the things that are praiseworthy. And, and I get it. I get it. You may have to sit there for a moment and be like, I really have to think hard about something that is praiseworthy in my life. But if you really invite the Holy Spirit into that, he will begin to show you. If you shut your brain down to just continuously talking about all the negative and thinking upon all the negative and you say, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for you to begin to resurrect things that are praiseworthy in my life right now. I don't care how simple they are in order to activate this new mind of Christ as you're walking through this wilderness and recognize that God is actually producing fruit in my life while I'm standing right here, right now, living in a reality of a wilderness, living in the reality of low productivity, I declare that God is producing life in me, not just life, but more life, because that's what the Bible tells me. That there is a biblical principle that says, every place where I feel death, there has to be life because biblically death produces life. Again, the death of Jesus, the death of yourself to Christ is where you came into the life of the spirit. Even looking at all of creation, the winter season produces more life in the following spring. So one of the things that I have found that helps me as I'm in a wilderness season is to remember that God is working all things in my life for my good and that he is intentional. And you can declare that, God, I declare that you are working in this season for my good and that you are intentional in my life. And so I do not fear the wilderness. I do not beg to be pulled out of the wilderness, but instead I shift my eyes. I set my heart and my mind upon you and I declare a shift of my perspective from what I'm not getting, what I'm not seeing to what you are doing and what I am getting and where I am going and what you are. Do you see what I'm saying? I need you to shift. I'm reminded in 2 Kings with the widow who she comes to e, uh, Elisha and she says, um, that the, the collector is coming after me and he's he's going to take everything that I have. He's going to take my two sons and he's going to take all of my household goods and, and I have nothing. I have nothing to give me. He's going to take everything away from me. And Elisha asks this one question. He says, tell me what you do have. It causes a pers perspective shift in her in a moment to stop talking about all the things that the enemy is stripping from her and is going to take from her he says, but tell me what you do have. And so a lot of times when we're in these wilderness seasons, the enemy is like, God's not doing this for you. And he's withholding that from you. And he's not, and we, we are left with this question that says, is God really good in the midst of this? And I want to ask you this question. Tell me what God is doing. Tell me what you do have. Tell me what is happening. Tell me what, what God, where you do see God working and choose to shift your mindset from what you don't see, don't see in the natural, to what you know in the spirit. All right. All right, guys, this sums up this episode talking about, is God really good in the middle of the wilderness? Redefining how we view a wilderness season. Now we're gonna be talking about different kinds of wilderness, how the enemy works in the wilderness. So make sure you hit that notification bell because I don't want you to miss out on how to walk in victory, even in the middle of a wilderness season. You and I are designed to master that wilderness. 
All right, remember, enforcing purpose, it starts with you.